welcome and happy new year to all our viewers. We're turning the page on yet another year. Here we are in 2017 and it's all things chamber. Welcome to In Focus, our public TV programming, channel WGTV, channel 11. Gentlemen, thanks for joining me. I'd like to introduce Phil D'Amico from the chamber. He is the incoming president of the chamber, the paid staff. <laughs> right. And uh, been on, uh, been on uh, duty about three months. And sitting next to him is Brad Van Vliet. Brad is uh, the incoming not chair. <laughs> not Sometimes it feels like yeah. Right and he is the president of Van Vliet Insurance, my boss, <laughs> and most importantly, my son. So welcome, gentlemen. Thanks Thank for you. coming out into the snow. It's great to be. I, I don't know if I, am I sitting here because of a reason between father and son, so you guys don't Probably get after each other. Yeah, the rose say, between yeah. the thorns, okay. Bill. <laughs> <laughs> and somebody might accuse us of having a bald man convention here with there you three go, fellas. Yeah, yeah, right. it. Uh, we'll, we won't dwell on that. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's shift into your background, Phil. I thought it'd be interesting for our viewers to find out what your background is um, as we have recently hired you here. Mm -hmm. And I was looking over your resume and saw that you came out of private enterprise, majority builders, mm -hmm. which was a uh, general contracting Correct. firm. Yeah. And you were in charge of business mm -hmm. development activities, business outreach strategies, mm -hmm. which I love those terms because they fit right into the wheelhouse, what we're doing at the chamber. And then you'll find this interesting, but you were a talk show host Correct. at a public TV station, much like this one, mm -hmm. and did that for a number of years, 2007 all the way up. So we may be changing chairs here shortly, <laughs> let you take over, but no, you're, good. you're going to be a nice addition to the community and uh, Whitewater TV, I'm sure. And you had community topics, economic outlook mm -hmm. kind of conversations that we're going to have this evening. And then in 2006 to 2012, you were actually working in a chamber mm -hmm. as director of business activities. Director of economic development, yeah. And so that gives you the, uh, puts you right into the uh, relationship that you're having here relative to chamber work, nonprofit, mm -hmm. that kind of thing. And then finally, you've been a girls varsity basketball coach. Yeah. Now I find that a pretty eclectic background for a gentleman that's done TV hosting, right. basketball coach, private enterprise, building industry, and then nonprofit with a chamber. So yeah, you're the, kind the, of a renaissance man, Phil. The basketball coach was by far the most stressful of all of them. <laughs> oh, <I'm laughs> yeah, sure. absolutely. They, they always say, um, and I, I remember, um, you know, I certainly remember Lou Holtz, a legendary football coach for Notre Dame, used to say there's a reason there's a before and after picture of coaches. So the before picture was much better than what you're looking at now. For sure. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm sure once the word gets out that you're a coach, you'll be getting calls to help coach. Richmond's always looking for coaches. It, it was it. It's extremely gratifying. I mean, when you have a chance to coach uh, youth and or high school athletes today, um, it, just the things that you get involved with uh, beyond the, the sports side of things, the life stuff, um, was it, it, it just ex extremely rewarding. Yeah. Good. Brad, before I ask you how Phil came to our community, I did want to point one thing out. Um, you're the incoming chair of the chamber in mm -hmm. 2017. I was the chair of the chamber in 1995, and I just pulled a plaque off my dad's uh, study at home, and he was on the chamber board in uh, 1967, the first year, because we're going to be celebrating the 50th Absolutely. year of the chamber. Gentlemen, this is pure silver back in Dad's day. They I'm went sure with the silver, not the tin plate that you uh, pass out now. And actual wood, too, probably. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I think that's kind of cool. Three generations of Van Vliet's uh, in the chamber. And it's amazing to me the chamber survived that. That's true. Uh, it, we put it on its heels. Brad, you may finish it off yeah, with your I'll, brain I'll here. I'll see what but, I can do. <laughs> but Brad you, might, Brad, you might tell us what brought Phil to our community. How did you folks find him? Um, well, what happened is we had Amy Oler Holdhouse was our leader for five or six years with the chamber. Um, did a great job at the chamber and, and getting us to where we're at today. Um, and Amy took advantage of an opportunity and she is now uh, at Earlham College. Uh, so Kathy Cruz Uribe at uh, IU East was the, the chair of the chamber at the time. Um, I was the incoming chair and so we said, we got to fill a, we got to fill a position. So we've uh, created a search committee, um, obviously posted it, uh, had a lot of applicants apply. Um, and so we went through the interview process and, and Phil rose to the top very quickly and a lot of the reasons you just mentioned for his experience, um, you know, and I think you'll see his excitement, his knowledge. Um, so we're really excited to have him here in, in Richmond. Good, good. Phil, 
You might set the table for us as far as what you want to accomplish here in terms of your plan of work. And I think we've got some slides that might sure. uh, accompany that because I think it's nice to outline the direction you want to take the chamber. Well, the first thing, real quick before we get into that, I, I think that's amazing what you brought up as far as the third generation um, individual in the family now running the chamber. That is one of the very reasons that Wayne County really appealed to me is that we have a, a, a young leadership like Brad, who I was so impressed with during the interview process, that's kind of the next wave that's taking over where, quite frankly, where the, where the community is going to go in the future. So that is a real, real strength that Wayne County has, and specifically young leaders like Brad coming up, that, that's the future. We're in really good hands with individuals like Brad. So it, it, during the interview process, that's what really impressed me. The other thing that came up during the interview process was is what you brought up, and I appreciate you bringing it up, is, is really where our chamber is at today and as it relates to, to having relevance in the community and having relevance for a, a chamber member. And chambers all across there, a lot smarter than me, and, and, and <clears throat> excuse me, leaders a lot smarter than me, came up with really four kind of key pillars that chambers are looking at today to make a difference. Um, certainly workforce development and education always at the top. Um, kind of bridging the gap between education and business. And a lot of, we hear so many times, I can't hire people. I've got openings, <clears throat> excuse me, but I can't find good people. And then education saying, we're doing everything we can to produce good people, so cutting, cutting that gap is number one. Um, certainly number two, public policy. There's a number of issues that affect business and the community at large. So the chamber taking a stance and potentially looking at some of those critical issues to help business succeed, um, some of the legislative affairs, that, that's really critical for chambers today. I think uh, you're going to have Valerie come in on economic development. We want to take a role in that, certainly work with her organization. And then finally, the last piece is the quality of life and the quality of place. We have to create an environment that's going to have individuals like Brad and uh, individuals, the next wave of leaders that want to be here and actually make a, make a difference here. We just had uh, a community topic on windmills. Yes, And I presume exactly. that would fall into the public policy it did. piece of this. And um, our community, uh, I think, discussed that and came up with a position paper, mm -hmm. uh, or at least the chamber came up with a position paper on uh, windmills. So that kind of shows the value, the leadership of digesting these subjects and and maybe putting a position out uh, for the public to understand. Yeah, and I think that's always, and Brad can talk to this as well, I think from a chamber board perspective, that's always the tricky part is what, what position should you be taking a position on? What, what should you be out front on? And what are the ones that you need to kind of just lay back? So I think that was really relevant to the business community. And I think that's where the chamber really wants to focus. If we are gonna take positions, how does it affect business? How does it affect the business community and the business owner? And I think that's really the, the relevant piece to that. You know, the first one you mentioned, workforce development, we hear about it, read about it. Uh, it's been a real challenge for uh, Wayne County yeah, as it, far as having enough and it was employable people. Yeah, and it was interesting. Brad sent a really interesting piece. I'd love mm -hmm. for you to comment on the millennials. Mm -hmm. um, just the next wave of employees and, and how they learn, how they communicate, how we as employers, how we as leaders really need to look at that. I thought it was pretty fascinating. Yeah, it was a great video. Yeah. Um, and I think somebody sent it to me and I forwarded yeah. it on, but um, you know, we probably need to get that and, and send it out in the community. But it, it, it addresses uh, young professionals and how we need to treat them different um, and, and just understanding uh, young young mm -hmm. people and how what makes us tick. Um, and, and I'm kind of on the edge. I'm, I'm not <laughs> quite a millennial, um, so I'm kind of even looking at it, trying to try to figure try to figure these individuals out as well. Um, but it was a good piece um, talking about, you know, from a, um, you know, basically blaming social media, yeah, and right. not blaming, but saying that you, we just got to realize these people are different, they respond different, um, and, and uh, when they get into the workforce, we need to know how to communicate with them. And so, you know, great workers, um, as long as we can engage them and they feel like they're a part of, of the business and the community, because they do, they want to make a yeah, difference. Absolutely. They want to be a part of these communities. They want to make sure their voices are heard, um, and, and we just got to find a way to do that. And one of them is the young professional group mm -hmm. um, and, and uh, I was a part of that for many years um, but we had the, the the YAP young adult <laughs> professionals which has then turned into hype which now stands for helping young professionals engage um, so we have brought that organization uh, with Phil's leadership back to the chamber and we're really excited about reconnecting with the young professionals here in this community um, to help make a difference I'm glad to hear that I've always felt that young people are the lifeblood of the community they are. and 
being a baby boomer and a classic baby <laughs> boomer born in 1950. I'm a baby boomer as well. Oh, you've joined yep, me. Absolutely. Yeah. But I see, when I look around town, I see so many folks that are in my age group that are heading businesses and organizations. They're going to be retiring, moving, et cetera, in the near future. And we have got to find young people to come up. And they've got to have to be engaged in the community. And uh, we know that's a challenge. So it's a, a, a major subject for the chamber. Yeah, what, what's interesting there, real quick, is that they said the two major decision makers now on whether someone belongs to an organization, whether they want to join the chamber, is the baby boomer generation and the millennials. Really? So you're at both ends. The baby boomers, they found, are the ones that are technically running the companies today. The, in a lot of cases, the chief executive and or a, a you know, a C-level executive. And then the millennials are the other ones that are coming up right behind them that are now taking leadership positions. Those are the two major uh, areas to, to focus on as it relates to chamber membership today. You talk about a clash of two cultures. Yeah, no yes. question. <laughs> we see it in our office. <laughs> yes. Absolutely, yeah. Because uh, we've had all four generations. Mm -hmm. At one yes. time we had an 80-year-old <laughs> wonderful lady um, and then boomers, um, Gen X, millennials yeah. and Gen, Gen X. X. Mm -hmm. yeah. And it's been interesting. Yeah. And they're all very different, as you they're just all, pointed they are out. Very yep. different. Yep. And exactly. great, all great employees. Absolutely. You just got to learn how to connect exactly. with which each of them a little different, what right. motivates them. That's right. And that's a big part of it. Well, this is a great lead in to the annual dinner, which is okay. a big event for the <laughs> chamber. It's kind of your crowning event, mm -hmm. both of you actually. Mm -hmm. It's a big event because you get four or five hundred people out five there. Five to six hundred people, yes. Five yeah. to six hundred. So, Brad, you might. Uh, talk to us about the dinner. I think we got some great videos because we're talking about young people and I think the speaker fits right into that MO that we were just discussing. Yeah, so uh, the annual dinner uh, is coming up. It's right around the corner and the theme this year is Together We Win. Um, I am a, a sports guy and, and Phil is <laughs> yeah. too. Um, I played football at Richmond and went on to play at Dayton um, and, and I lead at our office and I use the term team over and over and over again. It's you got to build a team. Um, it's it, it's uh, how to, you know again learning how to use the people you have, how to motivate them, um, and so that's the theme we want to bring uh, to the evening. So I think the speaker that we have touches base both on building a team and winning, um, and so he has that that culture that he's created within his business. So uh, the the name is Andy Medley. Andy is uh, the president of Perk. Uh, which is a marketing uh, company out of Indianapolis. Uh, he has been ranked as one of the top 500 fastest growing companies in the country, one of the 10 fastest growing companies in Indiana. Um, he's also been ranked as one of the top places to work um, in the country as well. And he's from uh, Newcastle. And he's a local guy. He's related to the Oler family. Doug Oler uh, is his uncle um, who won the Art Vivian Award in 2011. And you know, I can tell he's cool because when you put up his picture, he's wearing a T-shirt. <laughs> Only cool people can wear a T-shirt like that, and he has about a two-day growth. <laughs> and, uh, you know, that's kind of a signature of that generation. So, yep. you know, kind of a cutting-edge speaker. Yeah, really neat guy. And I, I think if people, hopefully you come to the event and you listen to him, but he's going to be very motivating, uh, very enthusiastic, a lot of energy. Uh, I was talking to a lady today and explaining uh, a little bit about him and his business, and she brought up a good point and said he sounds like the Google of Indiana. Yeah. So uh, that's, that's a good point. Uh, I, I, a lot of his employees roll around their 30,000-square-foot warehouse on, on scooters, um, but a lot of free thinking, open concept, um, but again, his whole theme is about winning, winning in the workplace and motivating and finding the right people and creating a culture. What I was going to say, and Brad just lead right into it, it these, these guys are so in tune with corporate culture and what it takes to be successful, and we heard uh, he's got a couple of promo you know, videos out that are phenomenal just talking about how to build that, that culture of, of success. and. They're so in tune with, to, to Brad's point, of how to develop that and then how to, you know, one of the best places to work, creating that environment where people want to show up every day and, and just have fun doing it. We, and we would agree with you because working together and we have 15 employees, mm -hmm. culture is so oh, important. It's critical. And yeah. we spend a lot of time and energy focusing on culture and teamwork mm -hmm. because uh, if everybody's pulling the oars together, you're pretty darn effective. <laughs> yep. uh, but it's not easy to get that done, especially across the four generations we just discussed. Western Michigan football coach, right? Um, Fleck was his last mm -hmm. name. Created that row your boat culture mm -hmm. so that everybody buys into the mission yeah. and everything they did all year was row the boat, row and, boat. you know, 13-0 and, and then yeah. of course lost a close one to Wisconsin yep. in the bowl game. 
but created a culture of we're, we're not going to lose, mm -hmm. uh, we're going to win. So I think culture, as you mentioned, is everything. Good. Might be a good chance to run the video to yeah, show a little bit from Andy, that, Andy uh, Medley. Video. I, I don't think he's in a black t-shirt in the video, <laughs> but he's still got that, that cool look vibe. <laughs> yeah. My name's Andy Medley. I'm co-founder and president of Perk. When we have individuals that come into this building and, and they're deciding to give a portion of their lives to it, it needs to be a right fit. That's why culture is so important. Everybody has had an experience where they've sat down with someone and left that, left that meeting feeling more energized, maybe feeling a little bit more optimistic about the day. That is magnetism for us and that is what we're trying to accomplish every time we have an interaction inside or outside of the walls. us a company that treats business as a game. Competitive greatness is how we play that game. Have an aspiration or a desire to be, our, be at our best. So competitive greatness is kind of that underlying theme. Savvy at the core um, and, and its definition is problem solving. Whether it's building a product and bringing it to life, whether it is trying to figure out the best consulting advice to provide a customer, um, savvy is problem solving and we like to exude that savviness. You put two people together that have um, similar attributes, similar characteristics, and one achieves greatness and the other one fails. And what's the difference? And they came up with uh, the idea that it's around this, this word grit. For us, it's, it's getting better every day. Understanding that not one big thing is what gets you a leap forward, but it's a bunch of little things. I can really see where he's going to be a captivating speaker and <laughs> mm -hmm. really hold people's attention. And I, I love that he's, he's all about consumer engagement which is really a message everybody in that audience can take home. You know, you hope in the annual dinner, you're out on a cold January night, usually a miserable night, and uh, you, you've, you want to take away a nugget of wisdom and information, and I think this guy's going to be good. I, th I think he's going to be very, uh, uh, very exciting to watch. What's, what's interesting is he talked about grit. So my 24-year-old son, who's now two years removed from college, and my 22-year-old daughter, who's going to graduate from IU in June, that, that word grit, it, they, that's the word they're using now. So what he's talking about is it, the, the graduates of today are very aware of that, that term. And I love the story that he's going to tell. Again, he's a local guy, graduated from Newcastle High School, um, went to college here in Indiana, went in and started this company just 15 years ago when he was in his 20s with his business partner. Said he started it in his living room. Now they have over 75 employees. Uh, they are in a 30,000 square foot warehouse. And so they just continue to grow and doing some great things. So we're just really excited about the message that he's going to bring. I think it's going to be a great event. I really want, hope we have a great turnout. Um, so we might show the slide about, about the details details of the event, um, but the uh, Chamber Annual Dinner uh, celebrating the 50th year uh, will be on Friday, January the 20th, 2017. Uh, it'll be at the Coleman Center, and again, it'll probably be the coldest night of the year and lots of snow and ice, but please come out and join us. Uh, the social hour starts at 6 p.m. at 7 p.m. Uh, sharp. We will start the dinner, and, and that'll lead right into the event. Uh, we're going to try to tighten up the event this year, get, get everybody in, give them a good meal, uh, give them some entertainment, um, and try to get you out of there by 9 o'clock. Um, so again, we have a great presenter. We're going to have music by the Wing Walkers. Uh, we have Gallo and Old, Old Richmond Inn providing the food. Um, so I think it will be another fantastic night. Really excited about it. And uh, so again, call the chamber or go online to, to get your tickets. And Brad, uh, we're going to have some uh, winners, some community recognition of folks for various accomplishments in the business community. Um, and I'm trying to think of one of the uh, awards in particular. Um, was the Arthur Vivian, uh, Art Vivian Citizen Award. of the mm -hmm. Year Award, which mm -hmm. is Penny Wicks. It's not a secret, yep. but I interviewed Penny on this show, and she is a whirlwind. I think I called her a linebacker on the <laughs> field of play, this diminutive little lady, but she has done so many great things for the town of uh, Hagerstown in terms mm -hmm. of business investment, businesses, employer, um, maintaining some of their uh, 
community buildings, et cetera. So she's, she's been terrific. So yep. I don't know if you have any other teases there for winners. Yeah, uh, we, again, none of them are secrets, but we have some, some great winners this year um, from individuals to small business, large business, corporation of the year. The Art Vivian's always a fantastic award. We're really excited to give that to Penny. Well deserving to her and all the things she's mm -hmm. done at Hagerstown. I believe she has a handful of different businesses oh, yeah. that she's involved with. Uh, so we'll get to highlight those. Uh, Cope Environmental Center just built a fantastic building. Um, and so they've been honored in the past, but this year they're actually getting the Buy Local Award. And the reason for that is because they built a state-of-the-art, one-of-a-kind building about as green as they can be. Um, I call it Leeds on Steroids. Um, and, and it's one of only a handful in the entire country. And it's right here in Wayne County. And so uh, it's a buy local project. Uh, we had a, a team of, of contractors that, that built that between uh, Danny Stamper and, uh, and Lake Off Construction. And those two teamed up and, and put together just a fantastic building. And so we want to highlight the local contractors and all the sub that were involved with that. Um, so that, that's a, a really neat award, I believe, as well. Um, and then Kathy's even going to be winning an yeah, award from IU East as, as Corporation of the Year. Um, and, and the phenomenal things that IU East has done, brought to this community, increased enrollment, um, have a new facility out there, Athletic Wellness Center. And you mentioned Kathy, Kathy Uribe Cruz, mm -hmm. the, the past chair. Past chair. Your, uh, Taking uh, yes. her chair. Yes. Starting. So I actually nominated her for that award. I thought she was, you know, again for not just her, but all of IU East for what they've done uh, and what they've brought to this community. Um, so that, that's just a, a small sample of, of some of the awards that we're going to be Great. handing out. Great. Well, it looks like a mountain. terrific event. I know a lot of planning goes into it, a lot oh, yeah. of work. Mm -hmm. You have sponsors. I know we have folks that lay out some serious money to make all this happen and mm -hmm. put together a first-rate event. I think there's another slide highlighting some of those sponsors yeah. uh, with First Bank Richmond, uh, Richmond Banking, as well as West End Bank. So those three businesses obviously are uh, believe in us as the chamber and what we're doing, and we're really excited to partner with them again um, to have a great night. Great, great. Well, I wish you the best. I wish I was going to be there, but I think I'll be on a beach in Costa Rica. But send me an email, a photo, a video, something. You realize you have no sympathy on this side of the room. <laughs> well, you remember I kept talking about how cold it was in right. January, and I'm getting out of Dodge and heading down to the beaches of Dominical. Well, when we the, found out you weren't going to be there, we are like, oh, I was going to nominate him. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You are going to get all kinds of awards. We, yeah. we crossed sure, all those uh, off. Sure, yeah. I believe you guys. Well, I'm going to downshift uh, back to you, Phil, and talk about... Uh, where you came from, South Bend, because you and I had breakfast and mm -hmm. talked about your background up there, and I thought it might be fun for the viewers to see the difference between a, a South Bend and a Richmond, Indiana, the challenges, the issues, mm -hmm. and, of course, the assets. They've got Notre Dame up there, which is pretty darn cool. Yeah, we lost a lot of games, though, this year. Yeah, so. yeah. <laughs> it's been a rough year on the gridiron. And I think what's interesting, and you brought it up, and it's, it's a great point, is that um, there's so many similarities. The, the difference is Notre Dame is up there. It's a, you know obviously that's that does change the dynamics of that area. However, both I think this area and South Bend, and I think very similar to a lot of cities around Indiana, kind of uh, traditional manufacturing cities that are trying to recreate themselves or, or transform themselves uh, into some new newer opportunities. And I think that's very similar to what we saw in South Bend. Um, as well as what you're going to find almost everywhere else in Indiana as well. We, well, uh, in terms of what uh, Notre Dame brought to the table mm -hmm. up there vis-a-vis -vis what we have here, I don't know if you perceive that as a, a, a tremendous asset, how involved they were with the community. The education here is, is still, and you can talk to this as mm -hmm. well, it's still a critical component for future growth, for future opportunities, for future prosperity. Um, which, you know, the educational institutions, I think, are going to define where, you know, where I think regions go in the future. When I was in economic development, I, I asked a site selector out of Chicago, I said, where are people going to live um, in the next 20 years? And we're going to have Valerie on it. It'd be a great question to ask Valerie. And he said, anywhere where there's a, a university presence and anywhere where there's a university presence that's doing research and development. And he said, it doesn't matter if it's in the coldest of spots. Uh, or the furthest out of spots, universities and university presence will create that vibrancy and energy that communities look for. So that's the challenge, I think, for Brad and I here, is to really look at how we leverage um, the universities and the great colleges we have in this community to help us 
create that vibrancy and energy for the future. I think we sometimes forget that we're a college yeah. town as well. We have Earlham and IU East and Ivy Tech, and so we have some right great or, uh, educational opportunities in, in this community, and I don't know if we market it mm -hmm. well enough um, amongst ourselves because there are um, a, a lot of college students mm -hmm. here that we, that we sometimes forget about. So we're not Notre Dame, right. but we, we, can, no, we, you know, we, we can be proud of the educational opportunities we have. You know, there's a link there, too. When we have Valerie on in the second half of the show, mm -hmm. uh, we're going to talk about our trip to Japan, but uh, the Earlham International mm -hmm. Studies Program is a program that uh, I think focuses on Japan. And I, I believe, and we're going to flesh out these details with uh, Valerie when she gets here, that that's been a real plus for our community. And I think, you know, there are similarities between Earlham and the University of Notre Dame. You, worldwide, as you mentioned, they have an international presence. Typically, ex ex extremely high-end students, um, great education, uh, and long-standing traditions of great education uh, with great professors. So. I, there's a lot of similarities there, and and how to, as Brad mentioned, how to harness that and market it, and and really highlight that. That's the challenge that we have ahead of us. I want to connect some dots here. As we've been talking, I've heard about Western Michigan football, ah. Notre Dame, <laughs> uh, coaching girls uh, basketball. Right. Sports have been a common theme as we've been kicking this around here uh, this evening, and uh, and Valerie's going to join us. I happen to know she's an athlete. Um, but I wanted to ask you, fellas, how have ath athletics um, transferred over to business or your corporate experience? And Brad, I might start with you. I, I, I think it's everything. I, I tell people all the time, I learned as much on the football field as I did in the classroom. So I, I was lucky enough to have some fantastic coaches uh, that, that coached me through the years. And those lessons and those that I learned from them, uh, you know, I will take with me and, and use forever. But every day I, I bring this up in our office about the teamwork, the dedication, um, working together, uh, having a goal, and, and us, you know, having a cohesive unit in order to, to, to accomplish that goal. So, it, again, we, as we talked, it isn't easy. Um, but those, those uh, talking points and those uh, uh, topics within the business um, are extremely important. Our theme, and I'll bring this up at, on, um, at the dinner, um, when I was a senior in college, our coach always said, big team, little me. <laughs> and I didn't quite understand that maybe when I was there and I was playing, but now it makes so much sense. It's not about the individual. It's not about your individual statistics. It's about the team. It's about the score that's on the board, and it's about winning and succeeding in business and in life. So that's what I believe. And you got to give some props to your coach because he's one of the winningest coaches in football. Right. Coach Kelly is one of the winningest yeah. active coaches. He's now retired, but uh, he was he was phenomenal at University of Dayton. Most people have never heard of him, and and I think he he prefers to have it that way. Uh, he, he 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 would give the credit to the players, to his uh, assistant coaches, to the program. Um, but Dayton built up you know just a phenomenal uh, organization over the years, and they're continuing to win. They they uh, just had uh, one loss this year and and uh, uh, got in second place in their conference, but That's almost. Awesome. Made it to the playoffs, so um, they continue to, to succeed. Um, so I'm a big believer in that, and I played for Richard Bryan here at Richmond High School, and, and Richard had a great impact on me. Um, one thing I always remember, too, a, a wrestling coach once said to me, there's three ways to lead, by example, by example, and by example. <laughs> so that's, I've, I've always taken that to heart, and I try to do that in everything that, I, that I'm I love with. the locker room slogans. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the quitters never win, and winners never quit. Mm -hmm. uh, and they go on and on. Phil, how about you? What has sports done in your life? Well, first life? off, I know Brad's a linebacker, so if someone doesn't pay us, I'm bringing Brad with me. <laughs> good, good. I like it. I'll bring him in. I've with shrunk me. a little bit <laughs> to my playing days. You know, I think I think a lot of what Brad talked about. I, I think I look at it from a coach's perspective, and I think Brad would tell you they would never go into a game without a game plan. Mm -hmm. So I think that's been really, I think, critical for me to really understand the game plan. And you know, we had a great strategy session just this morning with Brad and and Kathy and our staff on where do you see things going in 2017 and what do we really need to do to make an impact. So I think, I think the game plan, attacking the game plan, having a strategy, um, and then I also think you know, being able to adjust on the, on the fly if you need to, I think is, is critical as well. So you know yourself in business, right? You could have the best laid game plans and sometimes they don't always come, come through. So, but I think you know, the strategy session we had today uh, some of the direction of the chamber and where we're getting support from Brad and Kathy and the board members, which which have been fantastic. Um, I think leading to 2017 will will give us a good game plan. You might talk about some of your fellow players on your team in terms of your staff there at the chamber. 
Melissa Vance and, and Brad talked about this when they hired me. He said, we run lean and mean, so, mm -hmm. and we do. But Melissa Vance has been tremendous. As far as planning the dinner, right to the T, we've got this thing scripted out, uh, right down to the decorations and so forth. She's phenomenal. She's, the, the attention to detail has been outstanding. Ed's so creative on the marketing and communication side. We've got some creative things that he's putting together on our website and some things that we want to do for this year. Um, I'm blessed to work with two pretty creative, uh, we're all pretty creative, and um, I'm, I'm blessed to work with two really dedicated individuals that love this community. Good, good. It sounds like an excellent team. It is, yep, it is. So, fellas, what do we want to get done in 2017? <laughs> if you had one, if I give you a magic wand and you could have your wish, what would it be? What would be your one... Uh, desire for the chamber here in Richmond, Indiana. Brad, I think a lot of it kind of was summarized in, in the four pillars, but probably number one is we've got to continue to grow our membership. Um, we've got to be relevant in the community, and I think we do that by creating value, and that value is created by the four pillars. Uh, we've got to educate, we've got to be involved, we've got to have a voice, um, and it, like I say, we've got to be relevant in, in the community where, where the businesses uh, you know, f find value and want to be a part of what the chamber is offering. I've always said the chamber is what you put into it, so uh, we want those people to want to be a part of it, to want to get involved because uh, there's a lot of great things going on uh, and obviously we support local business uh, we're going to have a voice we're going to help um, in, in workforce development mm -hmm. uh, we're going to help educate um, so there's a lot of good things going on we're excited about it and so uh, we got a sales guy right here who's got a lot of experience <laughs> um, so again it's it's connecting the dots phil may not know everybody in town yet uh, but he's sure knocked on a lot of doors and and uh, sent out a lot of emails and, and made a lot of phone calls and that's what it's going to take um, to, to kind of figure out who the players are, who the, who, who's, uh, you know, on your team in this community, um, and Phil's doing a great job of that, so we're really excited of what we can get accomplished in this year. How many chamber members are there? Uh, we currently have around 500, mm -hmm. 500 yep. uh, chamber members. So you know, we, even when I was chair of the chamber, that's always a challenge, mm -hmm. and, they, and you go out and you talk to business folks and out in the community, and they always go, well, what is a chamber done for me what will right. it do for me and and it's tough because it isn't intangible mm -hmm. uh, it's a it's an organization uh, an association if you will Phil you might want to put some flesh on those bones. Well, I think what Brad talked about is the relevancy factor we we do have to be able to sit across from you and others and say this is what your membership will do and this is what it'll get for you and I think to dovetail on, on Brad's point a little bit one of the other focuses for us will be to get out into the county mm -hmm. um, we're not just Richmond obviously it's Wayne County so we need to get out and I just spent uh, two and a half hours in Hagerstown for instance yesterday and have visited Fountain City and have gotten out into Centerville and uh, you know reached out to Beth Leisure and Cambridge City and those folks so Reaching out into the county and developing those relationships in the county is going to be another really area of focus for us this year. Good, good. Gentlemen, I, I want to thank you, and I'm, I'm not going to ask you to leave because we're getting ready for break, <laughs> and we're going to have Valerie join us. We're going to add uh, beauty and brains to this group. <laughs> and, she, and I would point out, not only is she attractive, but she is not bald. <laughs> right, yeah, that'd be good. Yeah, that'd be great. So, uh, we welcome her and we'll take a break. And uh, viewers, we'd lo love for you to join us for the second half of the show. We're going to talk about Valerie's trip to Japan. Uh, we have slides uh, and some new corporate acquisitions uh, that have joined the Richmond community. So we'll be right back. Thank you. Life can sometimes be chaotic. And with small children, it can be difficult to get to the doctor. Hi, Mrs. Towns. How are you doing? I have a sick little boy right here. I think he might have an ear infection. With Read Health Now virtual visits, you don't even need to leave your home. I'll send in a prescription for him. Quick, easy, convenient. I don't want to take the kids out today. Oh, hey, Doc. Read Health, right beside you, right now. Hi, I'm Melissa Vance from the Wayne County Area Chamber of Commerce and I'm looking forward to seeing you on Chamber Chat. This time I'll have with me Terry Robinson from Trademark Homes and Brett Rowland from Whitewater Construction. Then we'll wrap it up and talk all about the annual dinner and let you know who's winning the awards this year. Tuesdays at 8 p.m. See you soon.
Watch Wayne County Connection on WGTV Channel 11, Tuesdays at 6. I'm your host, Michael Swigert. This month, we are revisiting the Wayne County Commissioners. We'll be discussing some current events that are going on in Wayne County and learning things about what you can do to make Wayne County a great place to work, live, and play, and what our commissioners are doing to make that possible. Watch Wayne County Connection on WGTV, Tuesdays at 6. Thank you for staying with us. We're back with Valerie Schaefer, president of EDC. I want to demonstrate my multilingual talents and say konnichiwa. Arigato gozaimasu. I have no idea what she <laughs> just said. Thank um, you. She said, she said you, all you guys are bald. <laughs> <laughs> well, Valerie, I had to go with the Japanese. Uh, that happened to be the only Japanese I know. But you were very impressive with your response. Maybe you could tell me what I said. <laughs> But, you know, I, I love to travel, and I was really excited to have you as a guest to talk about the trip to Japan, not only, obviously, for a mission, what you're trying to accomplish, but I just loved other cultures, mm -hmm. people. I'm just fascinated by that. And I've had the good fortune in my life to be in Africa, down in South America. Uh, I'm just fascinated by foreign travel. So mm -hmm. could you share with us what the mission was, uh, what it was all about? And, and, of course, you know we have some slides as well, and I think... They're going to queue them up as you get into your presentation. Okay. Well, it was a fantastic opportunity for the mayor and I. I'm not sure if many people know, but Richmond is home to five Japanese companies. Um, it's For all five companies, it is their only U.S. locations. Oh, cool. And so we're very fortunate to have them select Richmond uh, as their home base in the United States. And so the primary purpose of the mission was to go over and meet with all of the headquarters of our Japanese companies and demonstrate our appreciation for their investment in our community. They could have chosen to locate anywhere in the United States and they selected Richmond, Indiana. And so for that reason, we were very fortunate to be able to have the opportunity to meet with high ranking officials over there face to face and uh, thank them for um, their commitment here. A lot of people also don't know that the state of Indiana has uh, the largest foreign direct investment per capita from Japan than any other state in the U.S. We are also the only state home to three automotive assembly plants based out of Japan, Subaru, Toyota, and Honda. And so a lot of our Japanese companies are suppliers to those mm -hmm. um, automotive uh, assembly plants. And um, also within the state of Indiana, we have over 260 Japanese companies that employ 52,000 Hoosiers. So they make a huge impact within the state of Indiana's economy. And here locally, um, you know, the impact that they have here isn't as great. A lot of the companies are smaller, but a lot of them have only had a U.S. presence for the last six to ten years, and so they're continuing to grow. I see a number of slides and you're still in the company of a bald man. Uh, <laughs> yes. Mayor Dave yes, Snow. Yes, Mayor Snow. Um, he and I went to represent Richmond, and then we were joined by my counterpart in Rush County, John McCain, mm -hmm. and Mayor Mike Pavey of Rushville. And they have one very large Japanese company in Rushville that they went over uh, to thank for their business and investment in their community. Um, but in addition to meeting with our existing companies, we also had the opportunity to meet with eight other prospecting companies, Japanese trading firms, law firms, all of which have either clients who are investing in the United States or have investments in the U.S. themselves. And so for us to be able to meet with big companies like Honda mm. to talk to them about the supply chain opportunities here in Richmond because of our location to the Toyota plant in, I'm sorry, the Honda plant in uh, Greensburg, 
Indiana and Marysville, Ohio was a great opportunity for us to get on their radar. Mm -hmm. um, Mitsubishi Heavy Industries was another big company that we met with that has diverse investments in various industry sectors. So we were able to kind of get on their radar as well as they're considering some uh, investments in the U.S. You know, it's interesting real quick to, to Valerie's point, a lot of, uh, when I worked in economic mm -hmm. development, one of the things we saw were countries like Japan and China want to get closer to their subs. So they look for business opportunities here in the states that are going to put their their, their subs closer to their product. Mm -hmm. And um, that's been a, a big area of focus for economic development organizations and companies located in, say, Richmond. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah. Well, and Richmond has a sister city, Unan City in Japan. <laughs> Unfortunately, we were not able to visit with them because our schedule was so jam-packed, but we are very hopeful that we'll go back again in the next couple of years and make it a priority to, to meet with our sister city. But we did have the opportunity to visit our sister state, Tochigi Prefecture, in which we were hosted by the vice governor for a very formal Japanese luncheon to learn more about the sister state and how that relationship came about and why it's important. And um, past governors have visited Tochigi several times and try to make it a regular trip every year to go over and meet with various companies over there. Isn't it important in the Japanese culture they like to face to face that's a big piece of their culture and I know it's a big deal to fly all the way to Japan that's a long trip <laughs> um, but I've heard through the years that that is very um, impactful for the Japanese people and their culture they want to meet people mm -hmm. and that, the relationships mean a lot to them. That's exactly right. Everything is about the relationship first and the business second. So for us to take the time, mm -hmm. you know, to go on a 14 hour flight to go over and meet with them face to face was a huge deal, especially because the mayor was in attendance. What did you think of the Japanese society? I've always been fascinated because they always seem to be so in lockstep. Uh, you know, their, their civility. Mm -hmm. I always hear the stories how uh, uh, respectful they are with each other and, mm -hmm. and their society. Were you impressed with that? Very much so. Yes, everyone was just so polite and um, you know gracious and um, was willing to help with anything that we needed. The, um, the staff at the hotels and the train stations, everyone was just very helpful for us and um, everything was so clean. <laughs> it was the cleanest place I've ever been and it was within every city within all five prefectures that we visited mm. I saw litter one time wow. while I was there that is impressive that very is. impressive and it's very interesting to me how seamlessly they blend the old culture mm. with the new modern technology and how the Millennials over there um, you know, everyone is impeccably dressed all the time. You know, you go out to, we go out to dinner in, in jeans and a sweater, <laughs> not them. You know, they, right. they, are, they are dressed to the nines. And so um, it, it really pushes you to want to be a better you when you're in Japan because everyone is just, seems to be performing at a very high level. Talk about the Earlham International Studies Program. Is, is that had an important um, place in helping us develop these relationships? Because I, I know it's a focus, mm -hmm. I think it's on Jap Japanese culture and language. I think so. Um, Earlham has, I think, the oldest Japanese exchange program in the country. And it's with Wasadi University based out of Tokyo. And while we were in Japan, we had the opportunity to meet with the um, director of Japanese studies at Wasada and talk about how we can enhance the relationship in the exchange program with Earlham. Uh, one of the ideas that we had was to look at internships, both in Richmond and in Japan for the mm. Richmond-based companies um, that are headquartered there so that as students are, um, you know, ex visiting one country for an entire year, um, they can have an internship opportunity with the idea that once they return back to where they're from, they could actually be placed in one of these companies for a permanent position. And so I'll be working with um, uh, Dyron Dabney at Earlham College. He's the new Japanese studies uh, dean here, and uh, we'll be furthering how to make that a reality. Yeah, good. fantastic. Good. And, and for our Japanese companies, um, I, I found out there that there's a lot of communication barriers for some of the Japanese executives mm -hmm. that come over and don't speak English very well. And so we're going to look at some internships focused on translation. And I think that will be great for Earlham students who are studying Japanese studies, Japanese language, to really be immersed in the business culture mm -hmm. side of things, and but also to be a great resource for the company executives while they're here. Good, mm -hmm. good. 
Well, we're going to reel you back in from Japan and now get back onto Richmond's <laughs> turn <laughs> and talk about some of your big successes in 2016. And, and you really, by any measure, had an outstanding year with the two new uh, businesses that are going to put roots down here in Richmond, mm -hmm. Indiana. And see, we have Blue Buffalo, and I would ask you to talk about that, and then Omen USA. Mm -hmm. But w the, I know the community is really excited about that. And they should be. Both of these companies are investing a lot of money in new operations here. Uh, for Omen Castings, they were the, f um, the first announcement we made in 2016. It was in January. And this, will, this is an Israeli company, and this will be their first U.S. operation. They are a high-pressure aluminum die casting operation, uh, tier two supplier to the automotive industry. So ironically, one of their major customers is Dana, which we know that we used to have a, a Dana, a couple Dana plants <laughs> here uh, that no longer exists. But it's interesting how you know Dana will still um, somewhat be supporting our local economy by buying products from Omen. But Omen is actually in the process of renovating uh, a portion of the former Sinran building located at 1600 Rich Road. And they're investing around $16 million in renovations and new uh, customized equipment for their operation. And they're actually getting close to having the facility ready and they're getting ready to start uh, hiring in the coming months. So they're putting their plan together in terms of uh, the types of employees that they need and how they plan to out outreach to the community. Their general manager, who I have met is from Israel. I remember his first name, Jor, but it's uh -huh. exciting to me to have th these folks from other countries coming and living in Richmond, Indiana. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's good for our community, Absolutely. that cross-pollination mm -hmm. um, of intellect, culture, uh, education. I couldn't agree more, and it's been a great learning experience for me. And then Blue Buffalo? Blue Buffalo, um, you know, that was a project that took many months of negotiations and working with local elected officials in order to get all of the incentives approved in order to move the project forward. Um, it's interesting because I attend um, the Industrial Asset Management Council conference twice a year. And that is an opportunity where I'm going out, I'm meeting with company executives, I'm meeting with site selection consultants that are hired to site new plants for companies and build upon relationships. You know, we talked about how important relationships are with the Japanese. Well, it's just as important with the site selector community. And I know, Phil, yeah. um, you're well aware of that. <laughs> um, and so at that conference is where the Blue Buffalo pro uh, project was actually, actually derived in the fall of 2015. And in the spring of 2016 is when we finalized the deal and got all of the final incentive proposals wow. uh, accepted. So I can't stress enough how important it is for me to be out traveling and for even others in the community to continue when you're out and about outside of Richmond to think about how you can try to cultivate new opportunities for the community. Talk to people about the assets that we have and why we're a good fit for their business because you never know what that trigger point may be that will get someone mm -hmm. interested in potentially locating a new business here. All, all Brad and I care about are they're going to be chamber members. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. What's up, Dave? Maybe, maybe what we can do is give her a bunch of applications. <laughs> she, could, she could kill it all. One, one call, so that would be great. I remember right. going to the groundbreaking ceremony, though, and I was really impressed with the people at, at Blue Buffalo and family oriented. I just yes. thought they were you know, really fun and they were excited. They were just, you could tell, so excited to be here. And they mentioned that they had all these criteria they were looking for. Mm -hmm. and, and somebody stood up and said, when they went down, Richmond offered every single one of the things they were looking for. And that mm -hmm. was the reason they made the, de the decision. And a lot of it was was because of you as well. Uh, they did comment how much you know you helped in that process. So congratulations. Thank you. Yeah, the, the the role of the EDC is to build a positive business case for the company in which that we're we're trying to woo to locate mm -hmm. here. And so you really have to listen and have your eyes open all the time to find out you know what's unique to this company and how do we have the assets that meet what they need at, at this time. And so with Blue Buffalo, everything just seamlessly fell into place. And um, it, it's, a, it's a great company. It's a growing company. And they'll be investing $147 million wow, in their new great. plant here. Um, they've acquired 89 acres and will be building a 400,000 square foot manufacturing, that's research right. and development, and yeah. warehousing operation here. And they have room to grow. And they've indicated, I've seen the plans where they're, they have phase two laid out and so pending their success in phase one um, we could see additional growth down the road. Great. How big of an asset is, is the I-70 corridor? Is that 
a huge point for businesses that look, it would seem like a natural that mm -hmm. businesses would appreciate that main thoroughfare. Absolutely, most of the companies that make inquiries, they wanna be within five miles of the interstate. And the Blue Buffalo site, uh, you can get to both interchanges, both mm -hmm. in Centerville and exit 149A in Richmond, um, within two, two and a half miles wow. each direction. Mm -hmm. So it's perfect for mm -hmm. east and west access. That's great. But some companies want interstate visibility, others don't. So it's important to have sites near the interstate, but not mm -hmm. on the interstate mm -hmm. as well. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Of course, one of the challenges we mentioned here is workforce development. We've got to have skilled, educated workers mm -hmm. for these folks to pick from as they gear up their businesses. And it, you didn't mention, but how many employees uh, would be projected for these two new businesses? Omen Castings will be employing uh, 100 by the end of 2018, and Blue Buffalo is looking at 165 by the end of 2019. That's outstanding. Mm -hmm. That would have yeah. a n big impact on our local economy. It is, but as you mentioned, workforce and education, it puts a lot of pressure on mm -hmm. us to deliver the workforce that they need in order to be successful. So I've been very pleased to hear that the Chamber, as mm -hmm. one of your uh, pillars, is really focused on workforce Absolutely. and education because um, that's one of the focuses of the EDC as well, and we really need one another to mm -hmm. be successful in those endeavors and to collaborate and, and really work together to make a, a greater impact. I know you've worked on alignment with our uh, higher institutions of learning, Ivy Tech and IU East, mm -hmm. relative to um, the educational background of folks graduating so mm -hmm. they'll align and fit into the needs of the local manufacturing community. Mm -hmm. you might talk about that and I think in particular is that Manufacturers Matters program? Yes, Manufacturing Matters was actually born out of a collaboration among the Chamber, the EDC, Ivy Tech and industry. Uh, we all got together and found out you know what are the needs of manufacturing mostly for entry-level positions. Um, we need to educate people on um, what it's like to work in manufacturing, um, why, it's, why manufacturing is important to our local economy, and then of course the types of skills they need in which to be successful. And so Manufacturing Matters um, really focuses on uh, many components for that entry level position, but due to the changing demand of employers, because it is employer driven, we're learning how to morph the structure of Manufacturing Matters into other training segments such as maintenance um, that's highly uh, needed within manufacturing Absolutely. today. That's <clears throat> certainly a job category that we have a shortage of in this community. Good. Yeah. We're doing a job fair. Joe Henry from your organization has been great to work with, but we're doing a job fair that's going to focus. Uh, one of the breakout sessions is there are other options for those that aren't going to a traditional four year school. Mm -hmm. And it might be manufacturing or what are my options if I'm not interested in going to a four year mm -hmm. school or getting a four year degree? and what other careers are there out there? And that's going to be a big part of the breakout session at the, at the job fair that we have. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I'm glad you brought that up because it, when you look at Germany, I think they have an, a world famous apprentice program mm -hmm. and they two track kids going to college or apprenticeships and they're, they're very effective with that. And I, I, for some reason, I think sometimes we've been remiss. We're pushing everybody to college mm -hmm. and there's going to be such a need in these other areas. I think make very good livings. You're right, and uh, within the state of Indiana, every one of five Hoosiers work in the manufacturing sector, so it's very important to our state economy. And, and of that, about 70% are 55 or older, so there's got to be the next wave of who is going to take mm -hmm. those jobs. Coming up. Yeah. yeah. Not yeah. only manufacturing, but uh, contractors. Right. Uh, finding yeah. people that can yes. swing a hammer and, and, and do a lot of build these things, uh, mm -hmm. these, these companies, is, is harder and harder. And we continue to hear that mm -hmm. in our line of business. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. You know, and that, that transitions to the quality of life piece that I think was another pillar. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But young people, th you know, they're looking at what their life is going to be like after work and on weekends, yeah. and that's a big, that's a big part, and, and I was young once, I mean, I remember that's important. Mm -hmm. And so the quality of life issue looms to be big, especially in these small mm -hmm. towns, because it can be very challenging. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, Brad and I remember a young man uh, that really gave us the seeds for young adult professionals. He was a trainee at Belden, and I, he was 25 years old and single. And I'll <laughs> never forget, he said, I, 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 I gotta get, I gotta, move out of this town, I gotta find a, a bigger stage. Mm -hmm. And he got transferred to Buffalo. 
<laughs> and I thought, holy cow, Buffalo. I'm not sure he increased his uh, game in Buffalo, but I told Brad I could see the need for the quality of life issue. Mm -hmm. And we boomers are comfortable in our lives and our view of the world. And it, sometimes I think that's a disservice because we're not getting out of the way the young people understand what their needs are and the, what their priorities are. They're not what ours are. Mm -hmm. And I'll hear boomers say, well, this is the way we did it. We joined these organizations. This was important to us. It's not important to these young people. Mm -hmm. And we have to step out of the way and let them uh, have their particular interests and focuses. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's going to be one of the challenges oh, for the chamber. Yeah. I remember when I was real involved with the young professional group in Hype, we brought in a consultant. Her name was Rebecca Ryan. I don't know if you remember I Rebecca. Mm -hmm. uh, but Rebecca was phenomenal. And she had the seven indexes of a cool community. And I always come back to that. And I, I think about how do we become a cool community? And, and this is what, and they basically had a blueprint for us of mm -hmm. this is what young professionals are looking for. These are the seven indexes. And Richmond has a lot of them. Education was one of them. Green space is another one transportation um, so uh, you know and I can't remember all seven mm -hmm. of them but they were you know I remember going through that list and thinking we're there mm -hmm. um, we just have to market it I think we're we hardest do. on ourselves and mm -hmm. that story of that gentleman who ended up transferring I remember hearing later that he said gosh I wish I could get back to Richmond I didn't realize how good it was <laughs> in that community when I was there and it, yeah. and it takes somebody to leave to realize that and I hear mm -hmm. that over and over again and they almost miss it um, so yes Richmond doesn't have everything but we do have a lot of qualities a great place to live um, great place to raise a family uh, very affordable living yeah. um, we're so close to larger mm -hmm. metropolitan areas of, with Cincinnati and mm -hmm. Indianapolis and Dayton and even Chicago so uh, I think there is a lot to offer and I think we're we're too hard on ourselves sometimes and, mm -hmm. and we have yeah. to remember that and we have to market it we got to sell right. it um, so hopefully with these opportunities that are new jobs and people coming in and what we're doing at the chamber, we're gonna make it a better place. He sounds like a chamber guy. He does, <laughs> he's gonna fit beautifully. Well, he and I were having that discussion over here. I was looking at Brad's day, and he did a radio spot for the annual dinner. Mm -hmm. He did a TV spot this evening, which we're doing now. <laughs> mm -hmm. And uh, and then you met with two excellent clients and opportunities in our office. Mm -hmm. And I thought, here's a 37-year-old guy that's engaged in the community, oh, yeah. leading a business, I mean, you don't get those opportunities in other towns. Mm -hmm. uh, we play on a smaller stage, but you can be more engaged. You can be part of something. And when you're part of something, it's more meaningful. It gives mm -hmm. you a richer life. So mm -hmm. yeah. I think these smaller communities do offer those opportunities, but we've got to lead uh, the horse to the water. Mm -hmm. Is that mm -hmm. the right cliche? Yeah, and mm -hmm. I think you're looking at two of really the future leaders of this community. And young, youthful, uh, experienced, savvy, understands what it takes uh, to grow and, and prosper. And I think this is the future that we're sitting next to. We well, you know that this is a great place to uh, thank you for coming in. And, and I think you folks helped us have a great show tonight. I thought it was very interesting. Um, I want to wish you two the best in your annual dinner. Thank Brad, you. your reign of terror for the chamber <laughs> yep. for this next year in 2000. Third generation. Third generation wow. of Van Fleets. Mm -hmm. Valerie, you had an outstanding year in 2016. I hope you can top that in <laughs> 2017. No pressure. It's be right. Right. I'll and, try my uh, best. To all our viewers, I want to wish you a great year in 2017. I think you can see that uh, our community and our area are in very good hands with these folks that have shared their ideas and experiences with us today. Take care. I'm Al Bledsoe. And I'm Ron Chappelle, co-host Hail with L at Proudly We Serve. We want to thank Premier Toyota and First Bank Richmond for their support. This is our first program for the year. Our guest is Pete McDaniels, our local Wayne County Veterans Service Officer. Proudly We Served, underwritten by Premier Toyota of Richmond and First Bank Richmond, airs Monday nights at 8 p.m. on WETV, Channel 20.
You are watching Whitewater Government Television, Channel 11.